Research has indicated that military and law enforcement marriages tend to suffer from higher rates of divorce than the general public. There's a lot of reasons for this. We're going to uncover many of those in today's episode, but more than anything, we want to talk about what are the struggles and obstacles that military and law enforcement marriages face, and how can you do some things differently so that you give your marriage the greatest opportunity for staying together, but also being strong and healthy. That's what we'll discuss in today's episode of Relationship Radio. And I'm joined today by a special guest, which is my husband, Rob Holmes. Welcome, Thank Rob. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now, you and I, of course, we got married when you were in the military and not long after, I mean, less than a month after getting married, you moved all the way across the world to South Korea, and I followed you shortly thereafter. So we spent the first seven years of our marriage with you being in the military. And then after you left the military, you went into law enforcement for a couple of years after that. So we have had the, I kind of want to say the unique experience, but I think it's pretty standard, actually, that a lot of people who leave the military also tend to go into some kind of law enforcement career in their future because it just tends to be the same. So for our listeners, let's talk about some of the struggles, either that we had or that our friends had. I mean, we were talking the other day about how many friends we had that are divorced from the military. It's heartbreaking. It's definitely it, the it is. the highest amount of divorce that we have known of our friend group. Yeah, it's it's depressing. Um, buckle up, this is a depressing episode. <laughs> but there's gonna be hope that we there is hope because you and I are still married. That's right. You know, my parents were military mm -hmm. for four years. My dad was a soldier. They're still married. Mm -hmm. Your sister and her forty years husband. Later. Yeah. He my, was yes, my for sister, her husband. Twenty years. They've been married. Uh, yeah, it has been. Golly, well, fifteen. He was in for twenty years. He was in for yep. twenty years. They've been married fifteen. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, the, the rates of divorce are higher. Mm -hmm. They are. I think that underscores the importance of choosing your spouse wisely. One one thing that members of the military are notorious for is not choosing their spouse wisely. And, you know, studies have, <laughs> there's the, a lot goes into it, but studies have shown that, you know, under stress, women, uh, when it comes to libido, stress will decrease a woman's libido. So if she's stressed out, she, she doesn't want to have sex. Well, the opposite can be true for men. Uh, that when men have been placed under stress, as long as now there's a, there's a point of diminishing return, extreme stress will shut down a man's libido too. But, but a healthy level of stress, which is like every day in the military, mm -hmm. if not slightly bordering on unhealthy, mm -hmm. can increase, especially when guys get back from training or a deployment or something like sure. they want to hit the bar, or the nightclub as a way of stress release, probably. stress release. Yeah. Obviously they want to do things with strangers. I was religious, so I didn't, seek sex at like bars and nightclubs and stuff, but most soldiers do. And then next thing you know, they are falling in love as men can often fall in love faster than women. Uh, the, the, every situation is unique, but on as a general rule, men tend to fall, fall in love faster, which is ironic because a lot of people mm -hmm. don't think of men as being as romantic as women. Mm -hmm. And uh, that stress from the military can often cause men to go into decisions that they would not have made had they been under less stress or been in an environment that was different. And so they'll often make rash decisions or um, guys will get a, I, I had a great friend, very good friend, best man at that wedding. And they knew each other for a few months and started dating. He goes to Iraq for a year and their wedding was slated for very short, like a month or two after he got back from Iraq. Mm -hmm. You know, pop quiz, do you think true or false did that marriage last, right? Uh, if you're guessing false, it didn't last, then you'd be correct. But it could have. It could have. Yes, it yeah. could have. It could have. My parents knew one another. By the time they said, I do, mm -hmm. on their wedding day, they knew one another for three months. 40 years later, they're still married. 
and they were in the military, all the things. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's possible. Yeah. It is possible. I would say it's not likely though. Well, here's the thing though. So the people that are likely listening to this are the ones saying, well, we are married. Yeah, I already made that decision. <laughs> Whether it was good or bad, because you could say that yeah. for us. I mean, we, barring the fact we knew each other as children, like a lot of people hear that and they're like, oh, you were lifelong friends. No, no. we knew each other as kids, fought together as kids over toys. Then didn't talk for 20 years or then 15 didn't talk years. For 20 years. It was like 15. Yeah, but knew of each other, knew, you know, yeah. family, friends were all the same, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. We dated for nine months were engaged for one because it was the week after you proposed that you got orders to South Korea. And so really quickly we made the decision of I'm going with you. Yes. Otherwise it would be you being gone for a year, coming back and then us yeah. getting married. That wouldn't work. We would have, we, we wouldn't have up. made it. No. And even us saying that, like there's an instance of, well, did we rush into it we too did. soon? Absolutely, we did because our first year of marriage was incredibly hard. Yeah. And so all of the odds were stacked against us, even in that first year of marriage of questions at times of like, what did we do? Was this the right choice? Mm -hmm. But we made it through. So what is it? So let's talk about some of those unique things. You you know, a lot of people in these military marriages. So I think it is an, inter an a good point to realize the relationship may have started more stressful than others. I know ours did. We didn't go on a honeymoon. The two days after we got married, you were taking your final check ride in flight school. You, we were packing up and moving literally halfway across the world. Didn't know anyone. So we didn't have any kind of support group. Once we got to Korea, I didn't have any friends. You didn't, you, you knew a couple of guys who had been in flight school with you there. Right. But we didn't have any of that support system. So these are some of the obstacles that yes. in normal marriages, don't typically happen. You typically start on this honeymoon high. You get to ease into your life together. And you and I were like thrown into a tornado. The, there's pros and cons. Mm -hmm. The cons are obvious. You're being taken completely. You're being like a tree that's pulled up, uh, you know, roots and everything out of the ground and planted on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. The advantage to that, though, is that you and I were in Korea, which the fact I was able to bring you with me was great. We, we had to fix our issues. Mm -hmm. We had to resolve conflict. No one could run to their parents. Right. And, you know, uh, we could have parents come visit, which it was actually really cool when your mom came and visited. But we, we couldn't go run back home, at least not easily. Mm -mm. And we, we didn't have friends and family there to kind of taint with bias Right. Our perception of each other. No. Because oftentimes if you get married, stay in the same hometown, everybody knows your spouse, everybody knows you, people will have opinions, good, bad, and otherwise, mm -hmm. about both of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you and your spouse are going through something, you know, the, the downside or the con in that scenario is that everybody's going to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. And they'll likely give it to you. So it was nice that we were in an environment where that was not the case. Yeah. So there was an advantage there. If you are in the military, you get married, and then you have to go deploy, mm. man, that's hard. Very hard. That's hard. Again, it goes back to pick the right person and things will work. But it, it's more than that, though. It is more than that. Uh, it's more than just picking the right person because things can fall apart with, quote, unquote, the right person. Mm -hmm. And things can work with the not right person, too. Yeah. I mean, I fully believed that I had married the right person when we got married. But then during that first year of marriage, because of the added stress, you became a different person. Yeah. To an extent, I became a different person because we all become, I mean, we all continue to grow and evolve as we age and as we, and as we get married or, you know, after we married, as we age, as we get older. And so, because of life circumstances, because of your career, you ended up changing. And so the expectation I had of our marriage and how things were going to go and how it was going to be ended up not at all being that way. Mm. And what we know from what we teach at Marriage Helper anyway is that there's a love path. You can fall in love with anyone. 
You can fall out of love with anyone. You just have to be intentional about following it. And I believe what happened, especially in our first year, is there was not intentionality towards each other. You had a lot of intentionality towards your work for, and not for bad reasons. You were a new lieutenant. You were in a brand new place. It was your first duty station. There was a lot to prove. You were a pilot. Like there was definitely a lot of expectation on you. And I don't know that I understood the demands of that. Neither of us, we, could, we couldn't have understood because neither of us have, had experienced it before. But there was a lack of intentionality in being there for each other when we needed to be. I would say, so I would say that's one obstacle that military marriages are going to face is it's harder to be intentional and there's a lot more outside stressors and demands that are going to try and keep you apart, including deployment. Yes. Also, when I think back to those times, I think priorities and prioritization Mm. matters. Mm -hmm. I went from being a bachelor to a married man Mm -hmm. in a foreign land Mm -hmm. and a guy who was used to at the end of a hard work day coming home and just blowing off steam with video games or just watching TV or me time. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's how I processed and, and decompressed. And so coming home to you, you were an extrovert sitting at home all day with nothing to do because you couldn't even have a car. We only had one car. Yeah. We weren't even allowed to have a second car until like a year later. And man, that was hard on you because you were stir crazy. And then I get home and you're like, oh, goody, somebody to finally talk to and interact with. And I'm like, leave me alone. I want to go play games. Mm-hmm. I want to just chill out. I don't want to spend time. So priorities matter. Going back, you know, if I could go back in time, I would allocate a decompression time for myself, like an hour, mm-hmm. and then commit to after that spending time with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to come up with ways to compromise with the car. I was so stressed out. I was unwilling to compromise whatsoever with the car issue. Mm-hmm. And in retrospect, we could have made it work where, you know, you go to work with me, I go in and you take the car, right? Could could have could have worked. I wish I had been willing to examine that possibility, but I was. I felt so stressed out. Yeah. That I wouldn't even think about it. And you were concerned because I remember we talked about it then and you were concerned with, but what if I end up needing it? Like, what if my commander wants me to do something right then? Yes. And then I don't have the car. And that that was actually the case a lot, truth be told. Right. So, I mean, hindsight again is 2020, but when it comes to if for the people who are in the situation, what is it that they can do? And what is it that we did? I mean, we talked about what we could have done. We could have been more intentional and prioritized certain things, and we should have. But what are some of the other things that need to happen in order to keep a military marriage or law enforcement marriage strong? Pray over your marriage. Um, Pray for your spouse. Work on yourself Mm -hmm. and your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I do believe that if you're genuinely trying to get closer to God, you you have the best odds of the marriage making it. Of the marriage making it. I do believe that the commitment to the hmm, I'm and, pot- and if the if the marriage doesn't make it, let's say you're like, I'm gonna just commit myself to getting as close to God as possible. My spouse either is or is not doing that. Mm-hmm. And let's say the marriage doesn't make it, unfortunately. You are still closer to God. Mm-hmm. And being closer to God doesn't mean that the storm isn't there. It just means you're wrapped in the the blanket or the cloak or the shelter of God while there's the storm around you. I believe you'll you'll have better odds of making it if you do commit yourself to God and getting close to God, loving God, praying, all those things. I believe you'll stand a better chance. There will still be marriages where one or both spouses are doing that that don't make it for whatever reason. But you're still better off. You're still better off. And, um, you know, if you are in a marriage that's not making it, 
and let's say you're both committed to God in a form and fashion. That is where <laughs> marriage helper would actually be able to really come in and step in and help people. Um, but the, the number one thing I would say is just commit to spiritual health in your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I can tell you it probably won't be easy unless you're in the Air Force. <laughs> um, sorry, Air Force. It's, everybody knows you got it. But you get golf courses it. and chilies on your bases, so mm-hmm. we don't really want to hear about it. But, uh, you know, it, it actually it's hard for them too. All jokes aside. All jokes aside, It's, yes, it's hard it for is. them also. But we um, like to pick on them because I of several I love to pick reasons. on them. In fact. Steakhouses. They had steakhouses on the Air Force bases. Oh, of course. If I went back in the military, I would definitely want to be in the Air Force. <laughs> no question. So, um, you know, your, your spiritual health. That is the number one thing. And also try not to control your spouse. It is so tempting especially for us religious folks to be like, well, you know, my religion says they need to do it this way. And they say they subscribe to my religion too. So I'm going to take my religious book in my particular case, the Bible, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to weaponize it to control my spouse. They might put up with that for a little while. They might acquiesce for a little while, but it's a matter of time before they run away. Well, yeah. So especially if you're talking for giving your perspective as a service member, I think that can be a very common way that a man or a service member who's used to having people report to them. Oh yeah. That's the other thing. I forgot about that. Yeah. I forgot about it too, but coming home and you're expecting your home to be run like your platoon. Yeah. And ain't the same. (laughs) I, I remember as a younger man, I would go on mission trips overseas and there would be usually some women who were in their late twenties, early thirties in the group. And they were teachers for a profession. Mm -hmm. Here I am 18, 19, 20 years old. And there would be times, especially under stress, they would talk to me like I was a six year old Mm -hmm. because that's just what they're used to. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to be demeaning toward me. And I, I, of course I got rubbed very much the wrong way. Thankfully, I never said anything really rash or acted out really bad. The military can be very similar. A man or woman who is used to having giving orders and having those orders followed to some degree. Mm-hmm. And then they come home into a home environment and they start, like they can't turn off the boss switch. And, they, and they're also used to being able to having the answer. They're used to having the answers whether those are the correct answers or not, many military leaders think they have the answers. Used to not showing emotion. Used to not showing emotion. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, besides maybe anger when things aren't going your way. Um, Yeah, it it can create a toxic home environment that your marriage should not operate the same way your military relationships operate. Right. Because your your military relationships operate on a hierarchical level. Right. It is a hierarchy. I have this rank, you have that rank. I am either underneath you or above you or we're the same. Mm-hmm. And that's it, which also makes friendship hard in the military because you can only, you can generally only be friends with people who are the same rank or very close to your rank. Mm-hmm. And so you go home to your spouse and you're used to giving orders and you know all the stuff and it, it can create a very toxic home environment. Mm-hmm. I know it did for us, especially at first. Mm-hmm. So uh, don't mm-hmm. expect your spouse to react the same way that your coworkers do to things you say or do. Try and learn how to turn off the military switch, mm-hmm. whether that's leader, follower, NCO, officer, whatever you are. Mm-hmm. And if you're law enforcement, it's very important also. Mm-hmm. It's very important to turn off the cop switch when you get home. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The other thing I would like for you to speak to, and then I'll speak to the the wife or the quote unquote stay at home spouse in the situation. But the other thing I would want you to speak to is the emotion part of it. And I know that's a big, that's a big part, especially for the man who's in the service or in the force, the police force, where there's a certain level of training that you all receive to where you are supposed to be able to handle very stressful or um 
you know, hard to see circumstances and be able to block off the emotions to handle that circumstance. And so when you come home, there's a level of kind of a wall that's up Yeah. where you don't want to bring what you had, what you experienced at work home, but you also don't want to become too emotional at home either. So speak to how that needs to be different at home and how you can better handle that. That's hard. Mm-hmm. because there's things you go through, there's things you see, there's things you hear about or experience that are really trauma. And you don't want to bring that home. And in an effort to not bring it home, you often do bring it home. Mm-hmm. It's like mud on your boots. It's going to track inside. Mm-hmm. Best thing you can do is to sit there, take a minute, clean mud off your boots before you walk in, right? In the same way, You've got to figure out a way to process things you experience, especially the traumatic. Mm -hmm. And that may look like a qualified therapist with letters after their name. That may look like a healthy way of talking about stuff with your spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when you, when you get home after something traumatic or big has happened and you don't want to talk about it with your spouse because you don't want to burden them with that or you don't want to burden your family members or your children. The way you're going to go about dealing with that is to try and numb it or stuff it down or whatever. Yeah. And so it's still going to manifest. It's going to drive a wedge. Yeah. It's unavoidable that that will still manifest in a form and fashion. Right. And so you may need to talk to your spouse about what you saw, especially for cops. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, military members who've been deployed are more likely to experience trauma, but you can experience trauma even if you haven't been combat deployed. Mm -hmm. If you've been through SEER SEER school, as it's called, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and sometimes there's, there's almost like vicarious trauma too. Like I, I would sit in a car, you know, for 12 hours of time with other cops and they'll tell stories of things that they've experienced. And Mm -hmm. even though it's, I didn't experience that, there's still like a holy crap shock value to it that that happened. And a mental preparation of sorts. And a mental preparation that that could happen to me. Right. That I could be the one looking for the child and then find their body kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That the stories I've heard from other cops. And so, yeah, so there's kind of a vicarious. It's not quite the same. You know, you're li- not likely to receive PTSD vicariously, although you could. There is, there is such a thing as secondhand PTSD. But um, you know, whether it's firsthand, secondhand, like you're just you're in a mental state where you're ready for bad things to happen potentially, because mm-hmm. they very well may. Mm-hmm. And so you know, how do you how do you go home with that? And you need to find a way to have a healthy way to address it and not ignore it. So if you're in a camp where you feel like you've been ignoring it successfully for a while, I've got bad news. You haven't been. Your family members do notice. Mm -hmm. They might not say anything. It's going to manifest in just how you act, how you carry yourself, how stressed out you are, how you treat others. Yeah, It will be affected. You notice that Cops who have been cops for a few years, their personality changes, especially, uh, I hate to say, especially on night shift. Um, the personality changes over yeah. time. It's it's a lot more suspicious of other people, everybody, including family. You're suspicious uh, because you're exposed to liars all day. Every person you talk to is trying to lie their way out of a ticket or lie their way out of you know punishment or whatever. You're deeply suspicious. So, you know all these things happen. You become jaded, you you know, uh, and you need to, you need healthy outlets to go talk to someone about that. Maybe not your spouse, but you also should have hopefully the ability to speak with your spouse about some things in a healthy way. Yeah, even if it's not specific details, so that they kind of have an idea of right. this is what they go. Th- oh, that's why he was so. Mm-hmm stressed out when he came home from work the other day he had just you know worked a a car crash Mm -hmm. and saw dead people right and you know and i didn't realize Mm -hmm. that he had had to do that because he didn't say it yeah um so yeah it's it's one of those things you're you're going to encounter it's because you're encountering trauma 
at a much higher rate than those who, and this can apply to first responders, firemen, EMTs, and, and things, not yeah. just cops and military. And there's a lot of crossover too, by the way. There's a lot of people who are active duty. I have my best friend from college is active duty military, and he is a federal special agent. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be an MP, so you're both military and law enforcement. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of crossover. You could be military and a firefighter, a firefighter like in the Air Force or the Navy or something. So there's a lot of crossover there with, with those things, and you are going to have potentially a much higher risk of exposure to uh, traumatic events. And so there's just something you have to have an outlet to, to deal with that. Yeah. So what I hear so far, especially speaking from the service member or office law enforcement officer part of it, is there's a much higher degree of intentionality that needs to be present in in the relationship in a couple of ways. So number one, connecting with each other when you're home and making that quality and quantity time. The second is intentionality in getting professional help to process the stress, the trauma, the, the training even that you go through so that you can come home and be healthier. And an intentionality in sharing with your spouse the things that you're struggling with, even if it's not specific details, so that they can have an empathy for what's going on. So there's intentionality and prioritization on the service member's side of it. And then on the spouse's side of it, I would say there start with empathy because it can be really easy to sit at home and just fester and resent and not try and put yourself in your spouse's shoes of what they might be experiencing. So try and start with empathy. What are they experiencing? What's going on? The second thing I would say is continue to stay committed to making it work. I think one of the things in thinking of the several marriages that we saw, unfortunately, end, end in divorce, a lot of them fell in love with someone else. The, either the stay-at-home mom or the service member. And, um, you know, there wasn't an intentional, there wasn't a high level of commitment to, I'm going to make this work no matter what. I'm in it. Like, I will do what's best for this relationship and the outcome of it. And, and it can be harder, as we know, because there's a lot of moving, there's a lot of deployments, there's a lot of trainings, there's a lot of time away from each other, there's a lot more opportunity for fights, and there's a lot more opportunity to just say, I'm just going to divorce you. Or if you do this, yeah. I'm going to divorce you. And we know from research, as soon as you start using the D word as a type of you know ultimatum or anything like that, you have already decreased the amount of commitment that both people have in the marriage. So even if you have said that in the past, just stop, don't do it again, re-emphasize the commitment moving forward. I mean, I think that was something that, that you said to me once when we were stationed in Alabama and it was like, we were going, I don't even know if you remember, but it was the trip we were going to New Orleans. And before we left, you were like, if you do this, then I will divorce you. And then on mm -hmm. the trip, that happened. And I was mm. like, he's going to divorce me because he said he was going to divorce me. And for mm. me, it was that like, you don't just throw that around. No, and you shouldn't throw that around. You shouldn't throw that around. Granted, you didn't divorce me, but there was like, that trip was very terrible. Yeah, there was so much <laughs> terrible. Several reasons. We hate New Orleans now. Oh, we hate New Orleans. Um, but it was Sorry, also because of like stress that was happening in your life and and all the things we talked about were at their worst. And so you yes. were at your worst. I was definitely at my worst on that trip. And, and, and a lot of that was fueled by alcohol. So that, that and, and that brings alcohol. me to another point, you know, when you're when you're in military and law enforcement, there is a greater propensity to turn toward medicating behaviors. Mm-hmm that are entirely destructive, not just to your marriage, although they're very destructive to your marriage, they're destructive to you as a person. Yeah. Alcohol, porn, sex, affairs, uh, even spacing out with video games, mm -hmm. a ton can be one of them. There's so many vices. I, I only touch the surface of them. Drugs, yeah. Drugs, and drugs are a huge thing in the military. Um, they're Even in Korea, which is, it's not actually an island, but South Korea is virtually an island because you're not going to have imports coming from the north. You know, somehow dudes get drugs into Korea of all places. Like it's, you know, 
it's it's a problem even there because where there's a will there's a way you know you've got to make sure that you minimize those medicating behaviors mm -hmm. and you may need to go to therapy to help you with that and yeah that's all i'll say about that is, is really make sure to get those under control i remember that that new orleans trip was tainted with alcohol like throughout like i would oh, get, yeah i would get so drunk at times and then the next day i would be mean as a hornet and uh i i've actually since learned that there's a there's a scientific basis for that mm -hmm. and and the way dopamine works and dopamine deprivation and things of that nature but uh, but the bottom line is one needs to really minimize, mitigate, and cut out medicating behaviors. I'm not saying never drink, but if drinking is a problem, maybe take a break for a long time. Mm -hmm. right. And so, um, and if you don't address that, it's going to be really hard to work on yourself and work on your marriage. Yeah. And it's going to be hard to have a successful marriage. Um, it's not impossible. It's just difficult. Yeah. And yeah, I... I uh, I don't remember saying that on that trip, but it sounds like something I would say. And that was a bad space for both of us, especially me at the time. And, and you know, there's a ton of regrets going into the way I would go about problem solving and dealing with stress and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that was the, the final point for this episode that I would say for the spouse is similar to something you said earlier, which is... <laughs> you can't control the other person that tends to want to be the tendency of the service member because that's what they're used to. But also I can't, I could not control you. And because of the stress you were under, if you even felt like I was trying to, even if I wasn't trying to, but if you had the perception that I was or the perception I was being disrespectful, that was a big thing to you back then. Um, then that would like send you off. And so I, I got to the point where I was like, I can't feel like I'm walking on eggshells around him. But also I was so preoccupied with every action that I had. And what is he going to think? What is he going to do? Oh, yeah. How's he going to react to that? That I finally just said, all I can do is work on becoming my best self and stop being so focused on you mm -hmm. and instead focus on me and God. And it was then where I would say like, for our relationship is pro that would be when I hit rock bottom was when I was like, I can't do anything. I don't know how to fix this, but I'm also committed. So what can I do? And that's when I said, I'm going to work on my pies, my physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual. I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to find friends. I'm going to do things to like get my focus off of just being so obsessed with our, the state of our marriage I'm going to do some other things and I am going to, instead of putting whether or not I was happy because of you, base that in God instead, which is what it should have been anyway. And I began to change and eventually you began to change. Be and I can't say it's because of the change I did, but I don't think that it hurt. It didn't hurt. I... Yeah, it didn't hurt. I had to come to a realization on my own later that I needed to work on me. Mm -hmm. But it certainly didn't hurt that you had started doing right. it with you. Because the other thing that happened was I stopped becoming so um, emotional in response to you. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to get angry at me at something, I was better able to just walk away instead of fighting back or instead of, you know, just continuing to make the situation work worse. So I had re I had gained a sense of being able to respond to you in a way where I would be very strong and calm, but gentle and loving in my mm -hmm. answers, but also like shutting down allowing you to continue down a certain road. Yeah, like if there was was emotional abuse or whatever, just been like, nope, not interested in that. Still love you. Bye-bye kind of thing. And yeah, and, and I do think that was, uh, it didn't hurt. Yeah, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. You know, you, you growing a backbone in many of those situations did not hurt. So some people might be scared, you know, uh, well, if I grow a backbone, my my husband might leave me or whatever, and I can't promise he won't, or she won't, or they won't. Can't promise that they won't, but I'd rather you have a backbone and a sense of self worth and dignity 
preferably that comes from God, mm -hmm. than to you know let someone be emotionally abusive. And hopefully that person realizes that they're wrong and they need to stop being that way. Not everyone will realize that. Some people are just in a toxic headspace and they won't stop. And it and that may lead to the end of the marriage at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you're still better off if yeah. you if you maintain your sense of self worth, dignity, and you know you shut down abuse not violently or or you know you don't counter abuse with abuse. You're just like nope. This is you know what you said that was an abusive thing that was not cool. I I know that I'm worth something because God says that I'm worth something because I'm a child of God. And I'm not interested in debating that point, you know, when somebody says something demeaning. And I, I don't remember all the things I said. I just, I know that I generally had a contemptuous demeanor about me toward you and others. Mm -hmm. And that was wrong. Mm -hmm. That was wrong. Uh, and when that manifests in a marriage, that's very toxic. Mm -hmm. In fact, Gottman says it's one of the four horsemen. Yeah. The worst contempt. one. It's the worst one, in fact. Mm -hmm. So, and and contempt can lead to a lot of emotionally abusive behavior where you say, when you say something contemptuous that is putting the other person down or trying to frame it as they're beneath you, that's emotional abuse, in my opinion. Um, and you don't have to cuss. You don't have to scream or yell. It could be even a calmly made comment about that other person's value as it relates to you and basically trying to let them know that they're beneath you. You could even say it in a calm manner, but it's abuse and it's not cool. It's not good. It's toxic. I can't really say you did a lot of that. I feel like there were times where I may have said something and then regretted it afterward. Like, Ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, yeah, that's probably that was... true. I never felt like you attack attacked my value or my character. Good. At all. I, if anything, at the worst of, you know, our relationship issues, I would say it was more of a, you were like actively pushing me away in, in certain, yeah. in the way that you would say things or the behaviors that you had or things like that. Um, or you would like, um, I accuse me <laughs> of being, of acting, uh, I can't even think of the word out of line of the sort. So I, I just remember the the one time in Alabama where I came in and it was right after that New Orleans trip. And I came in and I said, I love you, but I am leaving. <laughs> and I even hesitate to say it now because I'm like, we don't encourage separation at Marriage Helper and we don't. But that was a very terrible weekend. Mm -hmm. And so my response was for for better or for worse, my response was I'm going home, like I'm going up to my parents because mm -hmm. we weren't in Korea at that time. Um, and so I was like, I love you, but the way that things were handled this weekend, like the way you treated me is unacceptable. I'm leaving for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, that's when you were like, you're just storming out of here yelling. I was like, I'm not storming. I'm not mad. But like, so yeah. that's more of what you would do. You would like place more, more emphasis on things that I would say or do. Like you would add more to the situation than was actually there. Yeah. You would blow it out of proportion when I was like, I'm not yeah. doing that. Um, but then ultimately, yeah. like, we ended up moving past that season, but it took yeah, the, a the lot of Yeah, the framing work. of the situation was like, you're at fault. It's kind of like right. Russia yes. <laughs> getting geopolitical here. It's like Russia is, is trying to frame Ukraine for being at fault for Russia right. attacking Ukraine. <laughs> and yeah. It's like, how does that work? And yeah, the, there can definitely be times in a marriage where it's like that. It's yeah. like one spouse is the Russia attacking right. the other blaming the other for why you know and, right. and it's like that is come on that is what it was like yeah that is what it yeah. was like but overall we have made it through so far <laughs> stay tuned stay tuned oh my gosh well you're out of the military so at this point yeah we, we made it through the military the phase military and law enforcement unless i go back stay tuned oh my gosh <laughs> i'm just saying I am committed to this marriage. <laughs> yes, I am also. Thank you. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And you know, and that's one of those things come hell or high water. Let's just say I did have to go, at least, at least then we'd have the experience on our belt that we did it before. Like, well, let's just true. say something happens yeah. and I get called back because the nature we of the world. Well, and right we've now. already said what we would do different. And one of the yeah. things that we have said for years, I mean, ever since you left, even before you got out of the military, we were separated so many times, whether through choice or no choice that we decided we will never do it voluntarily. We will never voluntarily separate. And so even now, if I go on a work trip for just a couple of days, that's hard enough. Yeah. And we've talked in other settings and formats about even just how to come back together once you've been separated by choice or not by choice. Like, you know, if you were gone for training or when you were in Korea for an extra year, it's like getting to know each other again. It's almost like sleeping in the same bed with a stranger it's not um, fun. The reintegration of your lives is a very strange feeling. It is. And we don't want to have to go through that again if we don't have to. Not if so we don't we've have to. made a very a very a very intentional choice of like we will travel together as much as we can. We will do things together as a family as much mm-hmm. as we can because it's just not worth being apart. It's not if you don't have to be. And in the military you're going to have to be apart. You're going to have to. Yeah. Every time, you know. And so very much uh, to that point, if you don't have to, then don't. Yeah. If you can bring your spouse along, then bring your spouse along. Yeah. And the other thing I'll say is because we were a military and law enforcement marriage, we understand the importance of really prioritizing your marriage with us. So we talked about the whole time, yeah. uh, our workshop that we do, you and I have said multiple times, we did that right after we got married and we Mm -hmm. have said multiple times it saved our marriage before it ended. Like if we had not done that -hmm. workshop before going to Korea, I don't know what we would have done. It was bad. (laughs) It was bad. It was hard enough with all the situations stacked up against us in Korea. But if we didn't have at least some of those tools Mm -hmm. that we had used from that workshop, we would have handled so many more situations way worse. And of course it continues to inform and help our marriage to this day. And so that's why we do have a discount for law enforcement, for military members to come to our workshop, whether the online one or the in-person one. And we have people who ask a lot of times, but you know, my husband is stationed somewhere else right now. Can we attend separately for our online one? Yes. Is it the most ideal situation? No, but it's way more ideal for both of you to do something together while you're separated that's going to put your focus back on the marriage than waiting and things getting worse while someone is deployed or away on training. And so the online workshop is a great option for that. And as I said, we offer automatic scholarships for our military members and our law enforcement because you and I understand on a very personal level how hard it can be, but we also understand how much more support those people need. And of course, thank you for thank you for your service, but also for our listeners Mm -hmm. who have served, whether you are the one who's been in the service, law enforcement or military, or you're the one who's been at home, you're serving as well. And we thank you for the sacrifice you've made for your family and your marriage. Thank you. You know, especially those who are currently serving, Mm -hmm. uh, we do really appreciate it. Yeah. We're able to be comfortable and safe at night because you're either out patrolling the roads in the middle of the night as a cop. Mm Mm-hmm or you're actively in a position to help deter and prevent enemies from, you know, attacking us yeah. as a nation. So yes, thank you for your yeah. service. Yeah. And your family helps pay some of the price of that, but we don't want them oh, to yes. have to. They do. Yes. If you want to hear more of our story, we actually had our marriage story recorded. And so you can watch a more full length version of that by clicking the link below. And if you're ready to find out more about one of our workshops, the online or the in-person, then go to marriagehelper.com slash workshop. That's marriagehelper.com slash workshop, W-O-R-K-S-H-O-P, workshop singular. And you can find out more information about our workshops there (laughs) and how we can help you and hopefully your spouse really get the help that you need to have a thriving military or law enforcement marriage. Thank you for listening or thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube to this episode, we'll see you on next week's episode of Relationship Radio.